Hopefully, you have podiatrists within your practice that you refer to when a wound comes into the office. And in the same way, my colleagues should have one of your colleagues on speed dial in order to start the proper care for any type of wound that we're dealing with here. I do have no financial relationships or obligations to declare in going along with this lecture today, no conflicts of interest at all. So podiatric care is often the first stop for these wounds. And while wounds can seem something as simple as just a cut on the bottom of the foot or even a reddened area, they obviously can progress very rapidly. And everything that you see here and other wounds as well need immediate care. This is not the type of thing that you want a patient to sit back and say, well, let's see how it does. Prevention is the key. And early detection is what we do and what you should be doing as well. Just because you don't have an open weeping wound in front of you does not mean revascularization is not necessary. And this, of course, is the ultimate goal. We need to be able to close these wounds, and closing them not only means revascularizing. It doesn't just mean treating the wound, but also prevention as well. And this is where my colleagues in the podiatric world will come into play after your revascularization occurs. When a patient comes into the office with either a suspected wound or an open wound, we would do something similar to what you do, and that is to evaluate the patient's circulation. So of course, we will check the pedal pulses first. And the lack of a pedal pulse doesn't mean you should stop immediately. You should be looking around because of course, anomalies do occur. Temperature gradients are very important and not something that is often checked. We not only wanna see if the leg is getting cooler as you go down towards the toes, but is there a difference in temperature from one leg to the other? As far as hair loss goes, this is something that patients can often notice, especially in females who suddenly find that they don't need to shave or men that normally have a lot of hair. Again, the grass does not grow if it's not watered. And so it's important to recognize this classic symptom. Capillary filling is another way to check those tiny blood vessels. We all know that just because you have a palpable pulse on the top of the foot does not mean that the toes are getting perfused properly. And this is something that I often would teach my patients as well too. It is a ridiculously easy thing for them to do. It's certainly painless. And either having a um, family member or they themselves, if they can reach, to check this, not every half hour, is a good way to see if in fact vascular disease or peripheral vascular disease is in fact advancing. So the assessment is done, compromise is noted, and we then make the referral to your offices. But we're not gonna simply just kick them out the door. We've got to address these open wounds, or if there's an area that's suspected of breaking down, we need to teach the patient how to protect this area. This is a very classic pressure ulceration. But when you look at this, when this presents into the office, what are you really dealing with? And that is why it is so important for my colleagues and I to really see exactly the type of wound that we're talking about as far as dimension, as far as depth, as far as infection, et cetera. Here's another perfect example. If you look at this wound here, it does not look too dramatic. But if you take the circular area, that's all macerated tissue. This is not viable tissue. And because of that, that's not going to heal and it needs to be removed because it's actually going to be a deterrent for the edges of the tissue to grow together. By getting in there with sharp debridement, with being aggressive and taking it down until it bleeds, is going to give us a true diameter and depth of the ulceration and give us an initial clue of whether or not any circulation is in this area. And many, many times I've debrided wounds like this with no bleeding whatsoever. And that certainly sets off an alarm. This is what a wound should look like when you're finished with debridement and you're ready to begin the care of the wound. You can see the depth, you can see healthy borders, little bit of bleeding that lets us know we're getting to some viable tissue. And now can be determined, you know, the type of care we're going to be giving, 
the, whether it's going to be topical, whether it's going to be oral, whether it's going to be both, and of course, getting it over into your offices. Following sharp reduction, we often use enzymatic agents in order to continue to break down the base of the wound. If in fact you're not dealing with full thickness, these agents are a great non-traumatic way to get off non-viable tissue. But this is not necessarily the first way to go. And very often, again, if you have some circulation there, and if you have viable tissue underneath, something as simple as saline wet to dry dressings are absolutely appropriate and often are the first step that my colleagues and I will use for this. You really don't want to negate the effectiveness of simplicity. And in addition to the fact that it often works, it makes it very easy for home care. And very often we give patients orders and instructions that are just too difficult for them to do. And if you don't have a wound nurse coming at home, you're not going to be able to get the care followed properly. By keeping it simple and still appropriate, you will get this wound to heal. Please, 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 keep the bottle of betadine on the shelf. This is not the time to be dousing this with betadine. Betadine is extremely caustic. It will burn the edges of tissue. When it dries, it turns into hard crystal, which also causes tissue death. Betadine will absolutely kill any wound. There's no question about it that if infection is there, it will kill the infection, but it's gonna kill the wound as well too. So to wipe something down with betadine is fine, but you really wanna stick to simple saline washes and wet to dries if you're not gonna be introducing enzymatic or other agents for healing. Now that we've got the wound clean, now that we know what we're going to be covering it with, it's time to address the cause. And the biggest cause for wounds on the bottom of the feet is pressure from the foot hitting the ground. And so it's vitally important that we offload these areas. Yes, it can be addressed later if, in fact, surgical intervention is needed as far as the presence of bony prominences, et cetera. But nobody's going to open up this foot now and start dealing with bony tissue. We need to be able to just take the pressure off of it. And the key phrase is your pad where it ain't. By putting this thick padding around the wound, that's going to hit the ground first. And the pressure will not hit that open wound. And thereby, the bone inside is not pushing against this tissue and not causing viable tissue to break down. So when you see something like this, certainly it looks like enormous overkill. But in fact, this is going to promote healing. It's a combination of location and materials. You want to get something thick like felt or plastizote, and you want to pad where it's not by being able to have something hit the ground so that that area does not. And this includes areas that have not broken down. If you look at the side of that bunion deformity, that's turning red. That tissue is already stretched to the point where breakdown could occur. By teaching patients how to pad these things properly with materials that are readily available at any drugstore or medical supply house, you can allow this tissue to heal even in poor circulation situations so that in fact they don't break down. Shoes should be addressed as well. Proper fitting shoes are a key part to preventing any type of tissue breakdown in the foot. It seems simple, but I would truly estimate that 75% of the patients that come into my office are not wearing the right size shoes. And this is just a recipe for destruction. So if you see reddened areas, that means rubbing, that means friction. And of course, if you're dealing with someone who has neuropathy present, they don't even know that it's rubbing. And that rubbing is just gonna to continue to cause breakdown. Sometimes if you have a wound that is a little too large to offload or simple saline wet to dry is not getting it going initially, we will start working with compression bandages. And these are fabulous tools in our practice. Because you can add compression, you're not allowing the swelling to impede healing. The bandage itself is impregnated with zinc oxide, something similar to calamine lotion, and of course, glycerin. So it hydrates the tissue. It draws out as it dries. So it has an astringent effect. And one of the things I find very useful for this is it keeps the patient's hands off of it. So if you've got a good size wound, 
This is very often a good place to start. It will calm tissues down. It will get the swelling down. I often will add medication before I apply so that that medication is truly going to be seen to get in. These, these bandages do breathe. So you're not fully pulling it under occlusion. You are, in fact, hydrating and breathing the wound. But this is a very viable option. If a patient comes to you with this on in their, your practice and you feel the need to assess the wound and take it off, by all means do so. It is easy to reapply. Typically, these things are left on for a week at a time, unless, of course, there's excessive drainage and it's just not healthy to leave a um, wound bandage on that may just have too much material there that you don't want to leave on the wound itself. But many, many of these wounds can start healing by simply placing these types of paste bandages on. The other thing you want to see, and you should see coming into the office, is footwear to help offloading. If we can keep the foot from bending, if you keep it from rolling along the ball of the foot, if you can redistribute the pressure by building up certain areas in these various walking devices, it once again assists in taking the pressure off these areas, which will allow healing. If you have this pressure that caused the wound to begin with to continue, you can do everything in the world and that wound is just not going to heal. So it's vitally important we offload. You should see your patients in walking devices like this that do allow ambulation. Sometimes partial weight bearing is in the crutches that you see, but it's a very, very viable way to offload these areas. When you have a patient come to your office that is referred by a podiatrist, it's important that your staff do one of two things. If you are comfortable redressing these wounds, you want to instruct the patient to bring with them whatever they have for daily dressing changes. And some of these things you may keep in your office. Though very honestly, I haven't run into too many interventional radiologists with felt and paste bandages. But certainly if you do, or if the patient can bring it with them, by all means redress. But if you're not comfortable doing this, or frankly, you just don't want to take it upon yourself to do so, have your staff call the referring podiatrist's office and set up an appointment for the same day. Podiatrists will do this. It's appropriate treatment. And very honestly, it doesn't take us very much time. But you don't want to have a couple of days with that wound having a break in care because things can reverse themselves, wounds can get dirty, and why miss that opportunity? So if you have a patient coming in that a podiatrist has referred for evaluation and revascularization, you need to instruct your staff to either have them bring their materials or to make an appointment same day with that podiatrist so the patient can leave your office, you can simply cover it with some gauze for the short trip, and then get into their offices so that that wound care can continue. Podiatrists absolutely recognize that we are not alone in this fight. And seeing the toe on the left turn into the toe on the right does not mean that we can't save limbs. What it means is we need to work together. So without you folks in there to revascularize the wounds and the limbs, this is the natural progression. But revascularization without wound care will not close this case. And so it's extremely important on your part to refer back to the podiatrist's office that has sent it to initially so that they can continue this type of care. It's important for you to understand who you're working with here. And so I'm going to take the last couple of minutes to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as colleagues go. Podiatrists have advanced tremendously over the last 30 years, even within the last 10, as far as training, and as far as expansive scope of practice. So yes, we do a tremendous amount of preventative care. We do a lot of surgery, a musculoskeletal conditions, but we're also dealing with a wide range of other things that are presented by the patients. And very often because we are the gatekeepers, we're the ones that notice things first. So we may be the one to initially diagnose PAD. I, in fact, have sent people over with an initial diagnosis of diabetes because I've noticed trophic changes within their feet and legs. No, I'm not going to start putting them on insulin, but I will be the one that will start the path to get that going. And so my colleagues and I 
as in the forefront of medicine, are really the ones that could be steering patients along. And because of that, our training needs to cover that. And in fact, it does. So like you, we go through four years of undergraduate, four years of medical school, and then a mandatory three-year hospital-based podiatric medicine and surgical residency. And over 50% add a fourth year in fellowship. These are not the days of a one-year residency and done. We are where you are. Many, many podiatrists nowadays are hospital-based. They're part of multi-specialty groups. We're in fact finding podiatry groups that are hiring interventional radiologists in order to come in and do one-stop shopping for patients. And again, the type of clinical care that we give. And it's important for you to understand that podiatrists come in many flavors. So not all podiatrists do wound care, just like not all podiatrists are surgeons. I have colleagues that are extremely successful in a sports medicine practice, in a podopediatric practice, in a geriatric practice. And so when you're going to be referring to podiatrists, it's important for you to know and understand exactly what their specialty deals with. My 36 years, spent a lot of time with diabetic care and prevention of complications because of diabetes. It was a specialty I chose. I was not the one to necessarily treat chin splints. It's not inappropriate for your staff or for you to check and make sure that you're working with the properly trained podiatrist so that your patients are gonna get the care that they need. Ulcerations are just a part of our medical lives. And if you deal with people with diabetes, then you need to know that over 25% of them will experience some sort of ulceration. And the key, key statistic to remember is that 85% of amputations are preventable with early intervention. We at the American Diabetes Association have been banging the drum on this for well over several years. And it's important to embrace this. We need to get the proper care and you are a big part of it, and we're the ones that should be steering us to you. A simple foot exam on a regular basis can identify the first signs. More and more, we're trying to teach patients to take on this responsibility themselves because patients need to own their disease. And the earlier things I talked about, of checking capillary filling, temperature gradients, hair loss, is a way to get in there early and thereby react early. And this, of course, is what it comes down to. By being, I, having a wound identified by me, by having the care started, by getting that referral over to you folks to get that revascularization to occur is gonna keep these things from becoming limb loss. And at the end of the day, that is all what we're aiming for.